I actually have patients in my practice who have been cured of recurrent cervix cancer because of immune therapy, something I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. This is the James Cancer-Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and my guest is Dr. David O'Malley. Dave is the director of the James Division of Gynecologic Oncology and the co-director of the Gyne Oncology Phase One program. He sees patients and is also involved in creating the clinical trials that are leading to better and better outcomes for patients. Today, Dave will fill us in on a new clinical trial that James is leading that utilizes two immunotherapy drugs to treat women with recurrent or advanced cervical cancer. Welcome, Dave. Oh, great to be here, Steve. Thanks for having me. It's always good to have you back on the podcast. And I don't think I've heard before your title as co-director of the phase one program. That sounds like clinical trials. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, clinical trials. So there's three different phases of clinical trials. The earliest on are phase one, and then the big giant ones are the phase three. So the big giant phase three trials are usually across the United States and often across the world. And what they're doing is they're comparing early phase, uh, uh, excuse me, what we've always done versus potentially a new option. And then the phase two, uh, we've already figured out the doses. And now what we're doing is seeing how these drugs work compared to our historical, uh, 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 how well things worked, right? And then the phase one, we're often still trying to figure out kind of the dose and safety. So that's the main goal of phase one. But we're a lot smarter with phase one trials. In the old days, we just keep throwing drug at patients, keep throwing drug at patients until they got so many... Uh, got so sick that we just say, okay, we've gotten a high enough dose. We're much smarter now. We know what the therapeutic window, meaning we know how much drug needs to be in the blood seam often to get the drug to work. And so what we do is we say, this is the level we want to go to. And how are we also smarter about that? Not just the toxicity, not just to making sure that we're not exposing people to too high or too low of drugs. But the other thing we do is we say, you know what, this drug has the best chance to work in cervix cancer. And so we're only going to enroll patients who have cervix cancer, for example. Sometimes we enroll, you know, anybody who has a cancer that can come in the trial. But we often are much smarter now than we used to be. More directive into the treatments to the to to get those treatments to the patients that are most apt to respond, and much safer for patients to go on these trials. And I tell my patients all the time. I tell them all the time. This is probably a little bit more higher risk, but potentially higher reward. These are some of the most cutting edge drugs which are available. In our own phase one program that I co-manage and co-run in GI Oncology with John Hayes, we're sometimes the first site in the world that's given a drug. And that's obviously very important for our patients to have ac access to these new agents. Well, so this uh, clinical trial we're going to talk about for advanced cervical cancer. Which phase is that in now? So this trial originally was a phase one trial and we figured out it was safe and it worked really well. And what I reported on is a phase two. So we knew the doses. And now what we're doing is we, we enrolled over 150 patients onto this trial with recurrent or advanced cervix cancer who had already been treated with the standard platinum-based therapy. And that's the most common treatment that we give for patients with cervix cancer that is locally uh, progressed or metastatic, meaning it's, it's metastasized beyond the cervix. Now, before we dig deeper into that, you call it cervix cancer, and I've been calling it cervical cancer. Is there a difference? Semantics. You're probably okay. saying it right. You know, I'm I'm okay. I'm a, I, I, I'm a modest modest background, Steve. I I, I just gotta make it up, man. Uh, well, I'm gonna cede to you as the expert on the stuff in cancer. So, <laughs> oh, it's just semantic. <laughs> cervix or cervical are, are both. Are, okay, I just wanted to make sure we're on the accurate. same page. No, you're both accurate. Okay, so let's talk again before we go into cervix cancer. I I I looked it up. It's um, cases are down thanks to, or severe cases and deaths are down because of the uh, PAP test. So when it's detected early, it sounds like there's uh, really good treatment options, but when it's not detected early for perhaps 
women who don't have access to the pap test and it's caught late. That's where you're seeing these advanced problems that would play into this clinical trial. Well, access to healthcare makes a big uh, difference. And obviously having patients take uh, ownership of their healthcare, making sure they're getting preventive maintenance like pap smears and and probably the most preventative maintenance is we actually have a a medication that can prevent this cancer called the HPV vaccine. And so it's really important to get uh, patients uh, uh, treated, uh, I shouldn't say patients, people treated early on in their life. But but even for people now, you know, the pap smear and the HPV testing uh, seems to be very predictive of precancerous lesions that can be treated so they don't become cancer. You're exactly right, Steve. But, th- but when it does get past that early stage and becomes perhaps bigger and even metastatic, that's where, that's where unfortunately, the bad outcomes come. Correct. And, and, and so if it spreads from the cervix straight out into the lymph nodes, into the areas surrounding, what we do is we treat with radiation and a low dose of chemotherapy to help that radiation work better. But when it, and, and, and those patients unfortunately still have a too high of a recurrence rate. Uh, and some patients have as high as a 40% recurrence rate, even when it's regionally confined. But then another uh, group of patients, unfortunately, are diagnosed and the cancer is already metastasized into the lungs, in the abdominal cavity. And, and those patients, the recurrent patients and those that had already metastasized were the patients that were treated in this trial. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Dave will break down this new trial, the drugs that are used and how they combine to create an even better treatment option for women. A revolution in lung cancer treatment is happening at the James. We're proving lung cancer isn't solely defined by location and stage, but rather the individual molecules and genes that drive it. Simply put, there is no routine lung cancer. That's why our world-renowned specialists put their expertise towards treating one particular lung cancer, yours. At The James, we go beyond the routine to prevent, detect, treat, and cure your lung cancer. To learn more, call 1-800-293-5066. We're back with Dave O'Malley, and we're talking about a, a new clinical trial for women with recurrent or advanced cervix cancer that Dave and The James are leading. So, Dave... Walk us through this clinical trial, the drugs that are used, what they do, and and how it's working. So right now, if we have a patient who has recurred or diagnosed with metastatic disease, we use carboplatin and paclitaxel. And many patients also receive the antivascular agent bevacivimab. And I'm going to call that Bev as we talk because it's very hard to say bevacivimab. Um, So that's the standard therapy. Unfortunately, almost all patients will then ultimately progress after receiving that regimen. And we have very limited options, unfortunately, for those patients. And recently, pembrolizumab was approved in women who are pdl one positive. And I'll talk about that more in a second. And so what we're doing here is utilizing a drug that has a similar mechanism of action to Pembro called balstilimab. And that's an anti-PD-1 inhibitor. And a second drug called zalfrilimab, which is something called an anti-CTLA-4 inhibitor. But I want to call them BAL and ZAL because it's a lot easier to say that. And yeah, definitely. We, is, you know, so, so we're going to go BAL, ZAL, and Steve, we, we can, we can okay. talk I, that way much easier. I, I can pronounce them. <laughs> there we go. I love it. But before and you so, go on, those, yeah. first, those first drugs you were talking about, were they chemotherapy or immunotherapy or, or both? So, so carboplatin and paclitaxel are standard uh, uh, chemotherapies, and BEV is an antivascular agent, which those three drugs together have been shown to improve how long people can live with recurrent or metastatic cervix cancer. So that's why we specifically looked at those patients who had received those therapies, because we're trying to improve upon the therapies that are available after those agents. Right. So this is the jump from chemotherapy, which is sort of a wide target to immunotherapy, which is a more select um, target and and better way to to target the PD-1. 
Well, and I, I don't know if I'd say it's select because it actually goes through the whole body, but I would okay. say it's, it's, a, it's a novel way to treat. And so uh, uh, what, a PD, what PD1, uh, PD-1 is, is actually uh, some people describe it as you know, kind of the force field. So what it is, the cancer's there, right? And, and the immune cells can get to the cancer but they can't get in and do their job. And why can't they do their job? Because of these blockers, which are in place, PDL1, right? So these blockers are in place. What these drugs do are they remove those blockers. So that's the balstilumab. It's removing those blockers, allowing the body to use its own immune system to get in and fight the cancer. Because the body knows the, that the cancer is a foreign body. And so we are trying to get rid of foreign bodies or viruses or whatever it is, right? Now, what the zalfrilumab is, which is this CTLA-4, the way I describe that is you have these tired immune cells. And they're just kind of like, man, I'm done fighting. It's been a long fight. I've been fighting this cancer. And what these CTLA-4, what we do is we further engage, okay, those immune cells. We get that we invigorate them to help fight off and get to the, that cancer. And so you have the PD-1 inhibitor that's removing those blockers, allowing those T lymphocytes, those immune cells to get in. And then you have the CTLA-4, which is which are getting those immune cells more, uh, more revved up, maybe overstated, but more of the T lymphocytes, those immune cells into and at the level of the cancer. Yeah. Oh, that makes such great sense. And it's easy to understand that the, the bowel allows the immune system to recognize the cancer cells and the ZAL, these tired cells in your, your immune system and been fighting cancer and struggling for months, if not longer, they need a little shot of a sports energy drink and this revitalizes them. And allows them to get in there and do their job and, and, and gets them re-energized. Kind of like after you come back from vacation, you know, you got that extra <laughs> energized. There you go. Your immune system needs a break and a, a vacation to come back and do its job stronger. There you exactly. So how's it working so far? First of all, you mentioned before that some of these clinical trials are national and international in scope. At what stage are you and how widespread is it? And what are you seeing in the women who are being treated? Yeah, so we we uh, took this trial across the world and uh, partnered with uh, the company Agenis, uh, who sponsored the trial. And I'm really proud to say that not only were we able to treat people here in the U.S., but we were able to treat people throughout the world. And cervix cancer is the number one uh, cancer of women uh, in many parts of the world. So we're taking these new agents, not just to benefit our patients here at the James and benefit those patients here in the U.S., but really across the world. And so what we did is we we originally looked at about 125 patients who had received that combination of those um, uh, of those agents I'd mentioned the the, the carbo and the paclitaxel and the bev, and then we uh, treated them all with Balanzal. And we did some testing. We looked at uh, the PDL one expression, which is again, how much of that blocker is there because it seems to, to work better uh, the more that PDL one is there. And what we found was that in the entire population, uh, about a quarter of the patients had their disease, disease shrink significantly. But if you look at the population of patients who express this PDL one one third of patients uh, had a significant tumors uh, regression. And if you look at the patients who benefited by treatment by keeping the disease stable and shrinking it, we had about two thirds of the patient benefiting. Now that may not sound as exciting, um, but as the standard here, the, the 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 percentage that we get tumors to shrink as of right now with our current therapies outside of immune therapies is less than 10% 10 or less. So we're taking tripling of those response rates, as well as a whole other group of patients who are benefiting from by keeping the disease stable. And not only did we see this disease regression, but when we looked at people who benefited, not only did they benefit immediately, 
but two thirds of the patients continued to benefit, continued to benefit beyond a year. And that is, is as, as a baseline, you would expect the benefit to be about three or four months of duration. And now we have two thirds of patients benefiting for more than a year. So not only do you have better response rates, the durability, how long they respond is also more pronounced to the point where if we go back and look at these patients, even out two years, two years, that uh, patients will still be responding. And I actually have patients in my practice who have been cured of recurrent cervix cancer because of immune therapy, something I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. Cured means five years out without any recurrence or is, or is, that, is there a different, okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, you know, what, what do you define it as five years, seven years, three years? I have patients who have gotten complete regression of their disease. I've uh, uh, stopped therapy. Often we stop therapy after two years and they're still without cancer uh, several years later. This is sort of a great example of the advances in cancer drugs, where you went from limited options, you went to that, that chemotherapy that you described, the three drugs that had a, a small advantage, but it wasn't long-term, to this new, the balance out, which it's not 100%, but we're getting you're getting closer. It's another step forward. So what does it mean that this is working? What does it mean for this treatment and even down the road five years when there's even better treatments? Well, I mean, we're in an unprecedented time of cancer therapy and cancer drug development or anti-cancer drug development. You know, I, again, I'm seeing things today that I really didn't think I would live to see. Um, and our technology in drug development process just continues to improve. And the Access to clinical trials is the key. Without clinical trials, we cannot see the, the, we will not see these drugs go to the next step to ultimately approval so that our patients can get these off of clinical trial. So approval by the FDA so they can be then prescribed. Wow. This must be pretty exciting times for you then. Amazing. Amazing. And we all are living in these amazing times. And again, access to large centers like the James, uh, where, you know, we are really able to personalize that medicine, uh, those medicines, we're able to do those tests to identify the patients who are most apt to uh, respond. And access, I like to say, access to tomorrow's therapies today. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Well, thank you for filling us in. That was a great overview and exciting news that, that's very encouraging. Thanks for having me, Steve. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.